Hello and welcome to part two of the physiologic and behavioral adaptations of the newborn. So in assessing newborn cardiac function or trying to help them transition, um, there's a few things that you guys really should be aware of. Their average resting heart rate is around 120 to 160. That's their average. And that's completely normal. I know a lot of you guys are used to taking care of adults who, and if they had a heart rate of 120 to 160, you would be very concerned. But we're not concerned at all because they're a baby and they don't have stroke volume. It may drop to 85 or 100 when they are sleeping and that's okay too. Uh, whenever you check a pulse on a baby, it's very important to auscultate an apical pulse, actually listen, and you wanna listen for a full minute. Um, during that time, you know, for about the first 30 seconds, you can assess the actual heart rate. And then during the second, you know, 30 second blip, you can assess for murmurs, abnormal rhythms, or beats. Um, trying to find pulses on a baby, it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit difficult or tricky, especially pedal pulses. Those are really hard to feel. The brachial and radial pulses are, um, they're, they're not bad. They're pretty easy to, to find. If the baby is only a couple hours old, you can actually palpate the base of the cord with your fingers and check for the heart rate there, which is kind of a cool trick, especially right after a baby is born. If you're trying to count the heart rate and the room is, you know, crazy, you know, because there's all these people in there for the delivery and you're having a hard time auscultating and hearing, just reach down and, you know, hold the cord between your fingers and you'll be able to auscultate the heart rate that way. Kind of a cool thing. Heart rates can be irregular. Murmurs obviously are gonna be produced from turbulent blood flow. It is completely normal for a baby to have a murmur in the first 48 hours. The baby is transitioning. Um, and how, and on the, other, on the other side, babies can have a very serious cardiac condition and have no murmur. So a murmur really in a baby is not something we get too worked up about until we know exactly what we're dealing with. As far as blood pressure goes in babies, we usually like it. It's the top number is usually 60 to 80-ish, and the bottom number is usually 40 to 50-ish. What we really look at is the, uh, the mean arterial pressure, or the MAP. The MAP should always be at least the baby's gestational age. So if you're taking care of a baby who is 32 weeks, um, then I want the MAP blood pressure to be at least 32 or greater. If you're taking care of a baby who is 38 weeks, then the mean blood pressure, the MAP, needs to be at least 38 as well. Does that make sense? What we are looking for, um, and then of course, if we check a four extremity blood pressure at 24 hours, what we're looking for is a difference in blood pressure from the upper and lower extremities. This can be a sign of a, um, a, a aortic coarctation. And then obviously, um, before any baby goes home, we always do a pre and post ductal pulse ox check prior to discharge. And we're looking for differences there too that can indicate a cardiac um, dysfunction. So if babies uh, have about, we'll just shoot in the middle, 85 mLs per kilogram of blood, um, let's say we had a baby who weighed 7 pounds, 7 ounces. That would translate into about 3.529 kilograms. That would mean if we use that 85 mLs per kilogram of blood, that would be about 300 mLs of blood, which you convert that to ounces is 10.5 ounces. That's less than a can of pop, to put that in perspective. That's how much blood they have. Or that's how much blood they don't have, uh, you could say. Uh, placental blood vessels contain about 75 to 125 mils of blood at term. Um, and holding, obviously, um, if we hold a baby below the level of the placenta, then we're going to send some of that blood over to the baby. Delayed cord clamping kind of basically does the exact same thing. Um, either holding the baby below the level of the placenta or um, doing the delayed cord clamping, either one can increase the baby's blood volume by 10%. This is fine for um, regular term babies, um, offers 
A little bit of, gives the babies a little bit of protection against anemia for up to six months. Uh, there is some polycythemia that can occur with delayed cord clamping. Um, it's usually not a big deal. Um, and it can place the baby at increased risk of uh, hyperbilirubinemia as well. But it's okay. The only time that you should really not consider delayed cord clamping is for babies who are small for gestational age or for premature babies. And that's just simply due to the increased risk of head bleeds and hyperbilirubinemia. In a small for gestational age baby um, or a preterm baby, uh, those uh, blood vessels in the, um, that are, surround the brain, they are just so fragile. And so you don't want to do anything that's going to stress them. You don't want to do anything that would engorge those blood vessels and cause them to leak um, because the blood does not respond well or the brain does not respond well when blood leaks out onto it. Um, if you're ever drawing blood from a baby, you should know um, and where you draw it, like as far as if it's from a capillary, like you prick their heel, or if you draw a venous sample or an arterial sample, your blood, uh, your blood values are going to be different. The side of the sample does matter because a capillary stick will yield a higher H and H than a peripheral stick. It is the sluggish blood flow in the peripherals that creates red blood cell stasis in the capillaries and can inflate the numbers. So how do you know that there? What are? How do you know that there's a problem? What are the signs of cardiovascular problems in a baby? Um, I'm going to say it's persistent tachycardia, um, and that would be a heart rate greater than 160. Um, this can be associated with anemia, uh, hypovolemia, hyperthermia, um, persistent bradycardia, which would be a heart rate less than a 100. This is associ associated with a congenital heart block or hypoxemia. One of the biggest things you can do is assess skin color. Um, pallor can be a sign of anemia or it can be a sign of peripheral vasoconstriction. Cyanosis of anything, anything besides the hands and feet is not normal. I'll say it again. Cyanosis on anywhere on a baby besides their hands and feet is not normal. Babies who are jaundiced at less than 24 hours of age also need to be evaluated for uh, blood type or RH incompatibility issues. Um, so again, it's, you know, when you're trying to assess cardiovascular issues, changes in skin color, pallor, jaundice, um, cyanosis, and then I'm going to throw in dyspnea too, even though it's kind of more of a respiratory thing. Um, dyspnea is just not ever normal. <laughs> So that would be a clue to uh, the nurse that there's something going on. So um, the level of hemoglobin um, that a baby has varies um, based off of a couple of things. You know, the amount of placental transfusion. Um, if a baby has a low PO intake, um, that's going to concentrate the um, that will concentrate a blood sample and then because of the uh, and they can also have decreased extracellular volume. Babies have elevated levels of red blood cells, hemoglobin and hematocrit than adults at birth normally and the biggest reason is because fetal circulation is less efficient at gas exchange um, than regular adult hemoglobin. So basically it takes more trucks to get the oxygen delivered. So instead of driving around with semi trucks, you know, if you think about, you know, little trucks driving around hauling oxygen, um, you know, instead of having semi trucks, you're driving around in like, you know, a little Volkswagen Beetle. You can't pack as much stuff in there. Then there are other factors that also affect the H and H levels too, such as delayed cord clamping, a baby's low PO intake, and subsequent decreased extracellular volume. Shortly after birth, hemoglobin levels in babies start to fall. And they continue that trend for the next two months. This is completely normal. It's referred to as physiologic anemia of infancy. Usually babies will level out at around three months of age. Hemoglobin levels fall from a decrease in red blood cell mass or the amount of circulating red blood cells because again fetal hemoglobin also has a shorter lifespan. It's not that the red blood cells are diluted out. 
delayed cord clamping increases blood volume, which is helpful because it does help protect against this normal anemia process. Um, again, delayed cord clamping is contraindicated for preterm and SGA babies. We already talked about that on the last slide. Um, it's also important to note that it's uh, normal for babies to have an increased white blood cell count after birth, and then it usually decreases pretty quickly. Leukocytes in babies are very slow to recognize infection, so you can't go by a white blood cell count to check for infection in a baby. Platelet counts are the same in babies and adults, um, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, factors uh, for coagulation. Babies cannot synthesize vitamin K because what do we have to have to make vitamin K? We have to have gut bacteria, right? Because vitamin K is normally made by our gut bacteria. But in a newborn, their gut is sterile because they usually, I mean, they've been tucked away inside mama. That's why babies get a shot of vitamin K in the thigh um, right after birth. Factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are dependent on vitamin K. Most of the time, babies shouldn't be bleeding a lot. So just the normal clotting process is usually sufficient to protect them against hemorrhage. However, in the case of shaken baby syndrome, and that's a whole nother thing, this is a contributing factor. Is, you know, especially you know, if the shaking happens in the first few days and the babies don't have adequate clotting factors, that can be an increased time for them to have increased, you know, increased bleeding issues. Although I'll be honest with you, in, in the case of shaken baby syndrome, fractured vessels and increased bleeding is part of it, but it's so much more. As far as temperature regulation goes, babies are homeothermic. That means they try and stabilize their core temperature within a narrow range despite variations in their environment. Um, we we strive to keep babies in a neutral thermal environment, which means that their metabolic rate, oxygen consumption rates are at a minimum, and their body temp is maintained because of thermal balance. That's what NTE means. The NTE for babies is 32 to 34 degrees Celsius, or 89.6 to 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit, with 50% humidity. Babies like it warm. Why do babies like it so warm? Well, number one, they have less subcutaneous fat. Babies are not born with a lot of extra insulation. You couple that with the fact that they have a very thin epidermis in their skin, so it's easy for the heat to escape. Because they don't have a lot of subcutaneous fat, blood vessels are closer to the skin surface Thus, they are um, also affected by the environmental temperature. It's important for babies to try and maintain a flexed position, which means that, you know, they keep, that's usually why babies keep their legs drawn up close to them. They keep their arms tucked in. They don't spread out. And, you know, you think they would because they have all this room after they're born, but they don't. They usually stay all, you know, all wadded up a little bit. Um, and that's a very, you know, that's a very smart mechanism for babies to help um, maintain their body temperature because it helps them conserve heat because they have decreased exposed body surface area. So less heat escapes. Hypothermia and cold stress are major threats to newborns. Hands down, <laughs> major threats. Basically, infants lose heat by two mechanisms, um, and you can read through both of those on your slide. And then there are four ways for babies to lose heat from the surface to the external environment. But basically, babies have a large surface area in relation to mass and poor insulation. Full-term babies lose four times the heat of an adult. So this slide just basically tries to explain the four ways that babies lose heat. The first one is by convection. Um, examples of this would be placing a baby um, or placing the crib or bassinet or whatever um, near the um, air conditioning vent. Um, mask O2, um, for, you know, if, it, if you're holding mask O2 over a baby right after birth, 
um, and just taking babies out of isolates when they're in their NICU. Those are all ways, um, those are all ways of convection heat loss. But basically you have a cool air current that blows over the baby and just whisks away their surface heat all around them. Then we have uh, radiation uh, heat loss, which is just basically uh, baby transfers uh, their heat to cooler objects that are ne not necessarily in contact with the baby. So this happens if you place cold items near a baby, such as um, we used to put um, ice on top of the isolate. We don't do that anymore, and the whole reason we did it wasn't really ice. It was, you know, bottles of frozen breast milk. We'd set them on top of the isolette to make sure that the right breast milk stayed with the correct baby. We don't do that anymore. There's a whole different process for all that stuff now, but that's an example of radiation. Evaporation means that the water is converted to vapor. So evaporation, this is what happens to babies right after delivery, because when babies are born, they're, you know, soaking wet. Um... And then the air, of course, is dry, and so that whisks the heat right away. And then uh, it, can, um, it can also happen um, after or during a bath. And the conduction, this is where nurses get that uh, classic cold hands. But basically the heat is transferred from the baby to cold surfaces that the baby is in contact with. So uh, you have cold hands and you touch a warm baby. You are going to, your, the baby's, your baby will give up its heat to your cold hands. If you place babies on a cold scale, if you place babies in a cold bed, place them in a cold warmer, all these things just cause stress to a baby. So what can you do as the nurse? Number one, crank up the heat in mom's room just before delivery. Once that mom starts pushing, run over there in the corner, crank the heat up, make it be a little bit warmer for baby. Again, everyone's going to complain and just explain to them that you are being an advocate for the baby and you are trying to prevent cold stress. And then everybody's going to say, okay, and they may roll their eyes at you, but they'll go along with it. Another thing you can do is bathe the baby in a warm room and dry the baby as you go. Um, that's absolutely a great idea, especially when babies are newborn. Um, I always would toss their baby soap because, you know, the soap is always in a Oh, you just leave it in the container that it comes in. But I toss the soap in there and let the soap warm up in the bath too. So you're putting warm soap on their head. Um, so whenever you bathe the baby, ideally you want to start at the, you always want to start with their face and just use a plain washcloth on their face. Um, clean their face off really good. And then you're going to start with their head, get it wet, soap it down, rinse it off, scrub it, soap it until you get all the birth goo and nasty and stuff out of it and then go ahead right then and dry their head go ahead and dry it and put a clean stocking cap back on them and then you can work on and this is why you have the baby all swaddled you know up anyway and then you're going to take one arm out of the swaddle and you're going to you know get it soapy and get it rinsed and dry it and then tuck it back in and then take the other arm out and you just slowly work your way down so that you know where you eventually, you know, clean their chest and clean their back, and then you want to clean their each leg, pull each leg out of the blanket at a time, and then of course you always save the diaper, the diaper area for last. Another thing you can do is put baby skin to skin with mom or dad immediately after birth. Most parents are like radiating heat machines. So if a baby is cold, put them skin to skin with either mom or dad immediately after birth or after the bath, and then just cover them with a warm blanket. And then um, as far as weighing babies, because that is a task that cannot be, we can't just skip the task because it happens to cause the babies to get cold, but you can do swaddled weighing. Um, take a newborn diaper, uh, the t-shirt and the blanket, wrap it all up, zero the scale, and then you can weigh the baby um, who is dressed and swaddled, and then you'll know exactly it will still be a very accurate weight. So how do babies make their own heat? Well, the first way is they can increase their metabolism. If they do that, however, they're going to become hypoglycemic quickly because again, babies don't have a lot of glycemic reserves, they don't have stores. So if they have to increase their metabolism, they're gonna burn through sugar and become hypoglycemic rather quickly. 
In fact, um, well, we'll get to the next point here in a second. They can also increase their muscle activity. Um, one of the ways that adults do that would be get up and run around. Well, obviously babies can't do that. Um, another way that people increase their muscle activity if they're cold is they shiver. However, in the case of newborns, babies rarely shiver. If they do, then their metabolic rate has already doubled. So, and honestly, it's not a very efficient way for them to make heat because the extra muscular activity really does very little to help their temperature. If a baby is shivering, that means that they have been cold for a while and they are like, that is one of their, you know, they are really struggling to try and, you know, increase their temperature and stay, you know, and stay warm. You should absolutely check their blood sugar if you see a baby shivering. The most common way and most efficient way for babies to make their own heat is by something called chemical thermogenesis or non-shivering thermogenesis or NST. NST is a pretty cool thing. Um, it is unique to newborns. I wish that adults could do this, as many of you probably wish too, but we can't. But it's uh, the causes the breakdown of brown adipose fat called bat fat. And then that's um, babies just start breaking down their little bat fat to fuel their metabolism. Bat fat is a primary source of heat in hypothermic newborns. This starts to appear in the fetus between 26 to 28 weeks, and it increases until two to five weeks after birth. Um, the bat fat is found in the mid-scapular region. It can be found around the neck, in the armpits, around the trachea, um, around the esophagus, around the abdominal aorta, kidneys, and adrenal glands. So it's kind of more centrally located in the baby. Skin receptors, what happens is skin receptors sense a drop in the environmental temperature and it sends a message to the um, SNS or the sympathetic nervous system um, to tap that supply of bat fat because they're cold. Pretty cool. So thermogenesis in babies, um, I told you guys on the last slide that cold babies develop hypoglycemia and respiratory distress. We know this. Um, term infants can usually deal with increased oxygen. They can deal with the increased oxygen needs when they are exposed to cold because again, it's going to increase their overall metabolism, increases their um, oxygen, their O2 needs also. The, the hard part is preterm babies cannot, they cannot deal with that. The ability to generate heat can be altered by hypoxia, acidosis, hypoglycemia, and medications that block the release of norepinephrine, such as Demerol. And by that, I'm not talking about giving a baby Demerol, I'm talking about babies who are in utero and mom gets Demerol. Demerol given to laboring moms slows and prevents the metabolism of that newborn brown fat or that bat fat that I talked about on the last slide. Sweating is the mechanism that term babies use to deal with hyperthermia if they get too warm. Sweat glands have limited function in babies until they are four weeks old. And I will tell you, I've never ever seen a preemie baby sweat at all. They just, they just don't. <laughs> Before four weeks of age, um, babies will vasodilate and lose heat out through their blood vessels through vasodilation. Because again, babies don't have, you know, thin, they don't have thick, toughened skin. And that's the way that, that that is their most efficient way for them to lose heat that way if they're hot. However, what happens if you have, you know, rapid vasodilation, it can also cause hypotension in babies as well. So baby kidneys are fully, have fully functioning nephrons by 34 to 36 weeks, weeks of age. Full-term babies have a limited ability to concentrate urine. So that just tells you that they're gonna pee a lot because they don't, they're not able to concentrate their urine. They do also have a decreased glomerular filtration rate. It's only about 30 to 50% of that of, a, of an adult. In general, we give babies about 24 hours to pee. If they don't pee within the first 24 hours, then it's important to assess the fluid intake um, assess them for bladder distension, restlessness, symptoms of pain, and then you have to notify the doctor. Sometimes in baby's first pee, the urine can appear uh, a little bit cloudy. And that's just due to leftover mucus and again, birth goo, things left over from delivery. Sometimes when you open up their diaper, you'll see a pinkish orange, uh, kind of like stain in there. Those are uric acid crystals that are found in the diaper. 
And what it means, um, just that the baby just needs to take in a little bit more fluid and just kind of flush some of those things out. And we've already talked about, um, sometimes you may find a slightly pink discharge in the diapers of baby girls too. Again, that's just completely normal. So 75% of a newborn's body weight is water. That is a lot. Um, and it is completely normal for babies to lose up to 10% of their body weight after birth from just diuresis. If babies are greater than 1,500 grams, then the daily fluid goals are, and those are listed for you on your slides. You guys can read them. So how do you know if there's a problem? This is what, you know, this is always the, you know, this is always something that nurses worry about. If babies are not voiding by 24 hours, if there are gross abnormalities such as hypo, uh, spadius, um, or um, the extrophy of the bladder, which just means like the bladder is on the outside of the body instead of the inside. Or if you palpate any type of kidney masses or enlargement, those are all signs that there's an issue and those tell the nurse to do something about it, like notify the pediatrician. And what does a fluid goal, to jump back up to fluid goals, what does that actually mean? Say that a baby weighs 30, 70 grams. That's a standard, you know, that's a very standard size baby. It's like seven pounds, seven ounces, I think. If you want an initial fluid goal of 80 mLs per kilogram per day, you would take 80 times 3.070, and that equals 245.6 mLs, and that's how many mLs the baby would get in 24 hours. You divide that 245.6 by 24 to get an hourly fluid goal of 10.2. That means that every hour if the baby was NPO, you would set your IV pump to 10.2 mLs per hour of preferably like D10. Um, if the baby was PO feeding, then you would adjust your fluids down to accommodate the um, extra fluid intake. Does that make sense? I hope so. As far as digestion and absorption goes, it's important to note that newborns have enough intestinal and pancreatic enzymes to digest simple carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Simple carbohydrates are going to be things like lactose, maltose, and sucrose, which are then split into galactose, fructose, and glucose. It's a lot of coses, right? The pancreatic enzyme amylase is lacking in production in the first few days of life. Babies have difficulty digesting starches which is why solid foods are delayed for the, until four to six months of age. That's why we don't give babies rice cereal or any kind of baby cereal in the beginning. Newborns digest fats with about 10 to 20 percent waste as compared to normal adults who have about 10 percent. It's also important to note that the fat in breast milk is better absorbed than the fat that's in cow's milk and formula. Uh, at birth, newborns have experienced swallowing, gastric emptying, and intestinal propulsion. We know this. Fetal peristalsis is stimulated by anoxia causing the coating in, in the amniotic fluid. So if you attend a delivery and the baby has already mecked, then you know that something has happened to that baby. The baby has been stressed and had some sort of hypoxic or completely anoxic event. And that's what causes, causes that is one of the reasons why babies will sometimes poop in utero. After babies are born, their gut fills with air within 24 hours. Bowel sounds are present within 30 to 60 minutes after birth. Salivary glands are not very active until about three months of age. And that's a very easy thing to notice too, because when babies are little, they don't really drool a lot. Um, but then all of a sudden at three months of age, that's when they need to start wearing the little bibs around their neck all the time because they just are constantly drooling all the time. Vomiting needs to be monitored closely for links to other problems. It's also important to note that newborns are spitty. Um, they have to spit up all that uh, mucus and birth goo that they swallowed from birth. Sometimes they will spit up blood too if there was any sort of, you know, blood in the amniotic fluid and that happens sometimes. So these pictures on this slide um, just help you see the transition of stools from that start with meconium on the left to completely normal breast milk stools on the right. Notice how the second picture looks a little bit green. That's the bilirubin coming out. So the normal transition of stools is to go from the tarry black stuff, which is the meconium, 
to kind of the green bilious looking stool to kind of like a um, seedy brownish yellow stool to eventually just like a mustard yellow uh, curdy curdy is that even a word curdy type of stool um, but yeah that's just kind of the whole progression of how baby stools go and the rest of this information on the slide you can pretty much read but in general we give babies 48 hours to have their first bowel movement after they're born most of the time they do it within the first 24 hours um, so that's usually not a big issue if they don't stool by 48 hours then we um, we always we will always do at least one rectal temperature on a baby um, usually on admission like to the nursery or admission to like the mother baby floor just to check for rec for rectal patency make sure that it's open that it's possible for them to stool and then after that um, sometimes babies will stool with their first feed sometimes they wait and stool you know a little bit later so you just wait and document it and go from there what does the liver do perhaps a better question is what does the liver not do your liver in your body is an amazing organ and it's very underappreciated. The liver does so much. Uh, but in babies, we're going to focus on just a few of its tasks. Um, it involves iron. It's an iron storage facility. Um, as your red blood cells die out, the iron is going to be stored in the liver until it is needed for new red blood cells. So it's just a big iron storage factory. Now, if mom was not anemic, then the babies are born with iron stores for about the first five months and then by about six months of age they're going to need an iron supplement but that's okay because usually by six months of age we start introducing what solid foods to babies and so they're going to start getting additional iron from the food from the solid food that they're going to start to eat so sometimes babies don't necessarily have to have a full-fledged vitamin supplement sometimes they get their vitamin supplement from the actual food that they're eating which is even better the liver also houses glycogen. Newborn glycogen stores are twice that of an adult. Babies experience their first energy crunch with birth as they are suddenly cut off from mom's glucose supply once the, once the, cord, the amni, uh, umbilical cord is cut. In those first few hours, they have to maintain their temperature, breathe, keep their muscles flexed, and all of that takes a lot of energy. Glucose is the main energy source for babies for the first four to six hours after birth. And then the liver also has a huge role in the uh, role in bilirubin conjugation. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. And then of course we know that the liver um, definitely affects coagulation factors as well. Conjugation of bilirubin. What is unconjugated bili? So um, basically it's just the breakdown of hemoglobin into the heme part. Um, and that is what causes the production of bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin is yellow, and that is referred to as indirect bili on lab, on lab work. Unconjugated bilirubin is the byproduct of the destruction of red blood cells. It's not in an excretable form, and it is toxic. It is stored in fatty tissues. So in order to get rid of this unconjugated bili that is not good for us, not good for babies, they have to conjugate it. So basically, it has to hook up with its friend, glucuronic acid, and then it can enter the digestive system and be excreted. Conjugated bile, which is referred to as direct on lab results, um, again, results when the liver enzymes, the glucuronic acid, attaches to the unconjugated bile, um, and then it becomes conjugated, then it's dumped into the common bile duct, then it's dumped into the duodenum, then it moves to the intestine where bacteria convert it to urobilinogen and, stero and stercobilinogen, and then that can be excreted through the poop. So did you know that bilirubin can be changed back to unconjugated once it's been conjugated? That's a really tricky thing. This is called recycling. Sometimes this occurs in babies with a very high beta-glucuronidase activity, um, those that are breastfed, and those with delayed bacterial colonization of the intestinal tract. So what in the world causes delayed bacterial colon colonization? Antibiotics, right? Antibiotics are going to cause a delayed colonization of the GI tract. 
what babies get antibiotics? NICU babies do. NICU admissions. They, um, when babies are admitted to the NICU, especially if there's a, a suspicion that they are sick or that they could possibly be septic, they are automatically started on, on antibiotics um, as soon as the blood cultures and you know whatever lab work is drawn, and then they will stay on antibiotics until the lab work comes back and says that they're not sick. So all of those babies, and this happens to even our term babies, so it's not just preterm babies, it's term babies too. Any NICU admission is at higher risk of having jaundice. And the reason is because they, have, they are started on antibiotics and you need that gut bacteria to produce the urobilinogen to help excrete and get rid of the bilirubin. Basically, the longer the conjugated bilirubin hangs out in the gut, the greater the chance it has of becoming unconjugated. This is why it's so important for babies to stool a lot after birth. How do we get babies to stool a lot? How do we get them to poop? Well, feed, feed, feed. The more a baby eats, the more likely they are to poop. The more they eat, the more they poop. It's a simple, it's a very simple equation. So physiologic jaundice is also called normal jaundice. This occurs in about 60% of term and 80% of preterm newborns. So odds are your baby's going to get jaundiced. Sometimes um, this is also known as breastfeeding jaundice, um, but breastfeeding jaundice is kind of like a different thing. But basically the cause is just the bilirubin is not getting out. <laughs> um, some of the causes can be from that. Um, you have an increased amount of bilirubin that's being delivered to the liver. Um, sometimes that happens with delayed cord, cl delayed cord clamping. It can um, occur with bruising because of the because of the extra destruction of red blood cells. Remember when I talked about, um, or I think, well, I talked to you. I I do talk to you guys about uh, different types of head molding and caputs and cephalohematomas and all those things are place babies at higher risk of um, of jaundice. And that is the whole reason. It's because you have um, you have an increased destruction of red blood cells, aka bruising which causes more um, bilirubin. If you think about it, head bruising, the, the head bruising that the full-term babies get and the total body bruising that preemies get, um, bruising destroys red blood cells and eventually those broken red blood cells end up being delivered to the liver and they have to deal with it and the liver itself is an immature organ. Another cause can be poor nutrition. If a baby is not getting enough calories, the formation of the hepatic binding proteins is decreased, which is going to cause a higher bilirubin level. The existing intracellular binding proteins remain saturated, and the amount of bad unconjugated bilirubin is going to increase. Another cause for this is going to be hypothyroidism. And then, of course, delays in bacterial colonization, delays in stooling, also contribute to an increased bilirubin level and you can get that recycling effect that we just talked about on the previous slide. As long as the jaundice occurs after the first 24 hours of life, and I'm going to stress that word again, after, babies should not get jaundiced within the first 24 hours. But as long as they start turning yellow after they're 24 hours old, then that's considered physiologic and that's normal jaundice. Usually serum bilirubin levels peak between three to five days in term babies and five to seven days in preterm babies. The treatment for jaundice is food. <laughs> feed, feed, feed the babies. The more they eat, the more they poop, and the faster the bilirubin level goes down. Uh, sometimes babies have to go under phototherapy, um, and that's just another way that helps their body break down the bilirubin faster. Sometimes if moms are trying to breastfeed, and their baby has a particularly higher level, then they will have mom feed, you know, breastfeed, and then they'll uh, top the baby off with some formula. Because um, again, we really need to push fluids. We really got to push that nutrition and food to help get them to poop. And then of course, we're going to monitor the serum bilirubin levels. Occasionally, or I actually I said on your slide rarely, a blood exchange transfusion is required. If a bilirubin level gets really to a critical high point, and we worry about it because uh, unconjugated bilirubin, circ uh, circulating unconjugated bilirubin 
it can, um, it's very, I mean, it is, it is completely toxic and it can cause uh, permanent brain damage. Um, absolutely permanent brain damage and the results of it, there's a condition called kernicterus and it's, it's a devastating condition and it used to happen a lot more and it, we don't see a lot of it anymore because nurses and doctors monitor serum bilirubin levels and we know how to intervene and how to prevent bili, uh, bili levels from getting too high. But if it, if a level gets too high, we can do a blood exchange transfusion, which just means that they would take, uh, you have to insert special IV lines, arterial lines, et cetera, in a baby, and then they take out a certain aliquot of blood, and then they would exchange it with different blood, and then you have to just keep pulling blood out, pushing blood in, pulling blood out, pushing blood in, until you know you have done a pretty good exchange amount. There's a lot of risks and complications with that, so um, the neonatologists try really hard not to ever have to do that. The other thing that I wanted to tell you guys is that jaundice moves in a head-to-toe progression, and that correlates with the serum levels. So usually jaundice begins in the head and the face, and so after, you know, usually 24 hours of life, if you push on a baby's nose, instead of blanching white, it's going to blanch yellow. As long, and then you can track the progression as the as the bili, serum bilirubin levels move up, the uh, jaundice in the baby's skin will move down. So sometimes, you know, after babies are about 48 hours of age, you may say the baby is jaundiced to the face and chest, or jaundiced all the way down to the hips, or jaundiced all the way down to the knees. If a baby is jaundiced from head all the way down to toes. That means tells you that their bilirubin level is actually really high, and you should definitely draw a serum level and check it. But if a baby has is just jaundice in the face, then their bilirubin level is probably pretty low. And this slide is just an example of a baby who's receiving phototherapy. Um, obviously, one of the most important things is make you make sure that their baby has eye shields on and make sure that they're able to maintain their temperature. Uh, this particular Billy light's called a Neo Blue. They're a high intensity light and they are a cool light. Sometimes we have, um, oh, there's some older lights, they're called bank lights. Bank lights are a lower intensity and they produce a lot of heat. And so you really have to monitor babies um, and make sure that they don't get too warm underneath the bank light. Um, the other thing is, uh, babies have a tendency to, they can get very dehydrated, so it's very important to monitor hydration status because um, when they're under bank lights, um, and then of course they're in the open air, it's easy for them to get dehydrated. But there are billy lights, there are billy beds, and there are also billy blankets. But if a baby, true, as long as you're in the hospital, then these neo blue high intensity lights are by far the gold standard. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about this other type of jaundice that happens. This is called breast milk jaundice. And this happens when, uh, so the baby is, we'll, we'll kind of go back. Baby's born, after 24 hours starts to get jaundice. Jaundice levels go up and then they start to go back down by day five or so. And then all of a sudden this weird phenomenon happens where the Billy Rubin's levels start to rise again after the baby is like a week old. Usually this uh, billy levels will peak at around two to three weeks of age. Um, and the cause is actually the composition of mom's breast milk. Um, that means that there could, it is, it's kind of a hypothesis, but there's a lot of free fatty acids which promote the increased reabsorption of billy from the intestine. So the treatment is just to monitor the billy levels. So if the billy level reaches 20, um, Sometimes the pediatrician will have the mom stop breed, uh, breastfeeding for like 24 hours um, and then switch to formula for 24 hours and then switch back. Or sometimes they'll just tell moms if it's, you know, pushing, you know, getting a little bit higher, they'll say, why don't you uh, breastfeed and then do like every other feed with formula and just have mom pump in between. Um, usually the issue seems to kind of work itself out. Um, usually, but usually moms don't have to stop breastfeeding very long if they st stop breastfeeding at all. And sometimes pediatricians will say, you know what, the benefits of breast milk are just so great, just keep feeding your way through it. So this slide just documents this breast milk jaundice that I was talking about. Um, this is actually my daughter. 
um, these are well these are my children in the, in the on this slide you can see a picture of her at two days of at two days old um, and she was pretty jaundiced in her face um, and then at three days old, bless her heart, she just looked like a little yellow squash pumpkin. She was just glowing. And we were feeding, feeding, feeding. And I was, you know, of course, stressed because I'm a baby nurse and I can see how incredibly jaundiced she is. Um, by six days, you can see that her skin tone looks a lot better. She does not look nearly as jaundiced as she did. And then um, her, her level continued to look better. And then suddenly after she was a week old, she started looking more jaundiced again. And it's like the jaundice kind of, um, she just looked more yellow again. We took her back to the doctor and I had another level checked and her level was 17, uh, pushing 18. And you can see at the picture when she's 13 days old, see, notice the skin, the, the difference in skin tone between her brothers and her. She is just yellow as a squash pumpkin again and her brothers are, you know, not. <laughs> they have normal skin color for them. Um, and then of course uh, the treatment was to supplement. I think I did every other feed with breast milk and formula for about 24 hours and then magically you know just laying off the breast milk just a little bit by 16 days old she's starting to look a little bit more pink and less yellow again. So coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are synthesized in the liver and activated by vitamin K. Now vitamin K is normally made by your normal flora gut bacteria, right? However, newborn guts are sterile and they don't have bacteria in them. So that's why we give babies a shot of vitamin K. It's to activate the clotting factors because the babies lack the gut bacteria which would normally synthesize the vitamin K. So we just give them a jump start to activate those coagulation factors. Sometimes newborns have some transient thrombocytopenia. Um, this can be accentuated by, uh, pho by phototherapy. Sometimes um, this can be caused by mother's medications if she's on like Dilantin or Phenobarb or Coumadin. And it can be caused by uh, maternal conditions if the mom has severe hypertension um, if she goes into HELP syndrome, which you know um, causes elevated liver enzymes, or has this, um, or, if, or if there's another condition called idiopathic isoimmune thrombocytic uh, purpura. Even with this vitamin K shot, it will be nine months, nine months until the levels of these coagulation factors reach adult levels. This is why it's so important to protect babies. Um, this is why we don't want them to fall. This is why, um, because they don't, they don't have good blood coagulation. They just don't have a lot of good coagulation factors. Um, this is another reason why shaken baby syndrome can cause such devastating results um, because you don't have blood coagulation. Babies also have low levels of factor 11, 12, and 13. However, the good news, fibrinogen and factor V are in good supply. So not everything is behind and that's nice. So this is just a reminder, if you're going to give babies a shot, we usually do it um, in the vastus lateralis muscle. Um, this just um, gives you the little landmarks again for where you want to, you know, give babies a shot. I have seen nurses mess up. Um, and the shot needs to be like in the actual vastus lateralis muscle. You guys are all trained, you know what, you know your landmarks, but it's on the side of the thigh. Nothing irritates me more than seeing a nurse who gives a baby a shot in the very top of the thigh. That is not the vastus lateralis muscle, and that is not where the shot is supposed to be given. So please pay attention and give the shot in the correct spot. Now we'll talk about some of the immunologic adaptations. The immune system is not fully activated until after birth. Um, because of that, and because babies don't have a strong inflammatory response, signs and symptoms of infection in a newborn are so subtle and they are completely nonspecific. Completely. <laughs> Newborns have a poor hypothalamic response to pyrogens which tells you that fever is not a reliable indicator of infection. In fact, even when babies are really sick, they do not usually run a fever. That is different in the case of a viral herpes infection. They will. But most of the time, they can be completely septic 
and instead of getting a high fever, they get hypothermic and they drop their temperature. Which is why I said hypothermia is a more reliable indicator of infection. Other signs and symptoms of infection in a newborn, seizures, hypoglycemia, and apnea and bradycardic events. Also, babies who lose their tone. Usually babies have a you know, nice tight tone. They like their arms flexed. They leave their little legs flexed up a lot. When babies lay there and they're floppy and they just lay like a wet noodle spra sprawled out in bed, that is not a sign of a healthy, happy baby. You, you also look for babies who sleep a lot. They start sleeping through feeds. They don't wake up crying. They don't wake up hungry. Um, so that would be a change in behavior. And then you look for babies who have poor feeds. They don't tolerate. When they do eat, they throw it up. They don't tolerate their feeds well. Or when they try and eat, they forget how to suck, swallow, and breathe. And then they have apnea and bradycardic events. So they get hypothermic. They, they get really sleepy, very lethargic. They sleep through feeds. They don't tolerate feeds well. This leads to apnea and bradycardia, hypoglycemia, and then seizures. If you think a baby is getting sick, the uh, pediatrician or the neonatologist will have you draw a CBC, a CRP, which is a C-reactive protein, and a blood culture, and then probably do an x-ray as well. Passive acquired immunity, this, these are your IgG antibodies, these are passed from mom to the baby during the third trimester. Those who are born before 34 weeks they're not going to get this and that sucks for them. When you are born in the second trimester, you're looking at the babies who were born from 24 weeks all the way up until that up until the third trimester. Those who are born at less than 34 weeks, they are going to be more susceptible to infection. They just will. Those IgG antibodies help protect the baby from bacteria and viruses and that protection lasts for about three months. It does vary a little bit, but it's around three months of age. So all these preterm babies, as if they didn't have enough on their plate already, they are at higher risk of infection because their shipment of IgG antibodies from mom, it, it they left. They it left the harbor before their freight actually arrived. Adult production of IgG, like the adult levels of IgG production, is achieved at four to six years of age. So it's going to be a long time before they get there. Now, IgM production starts at an eight weeks gestation. Um, if babies have elevated levels, it's, it is suggestive of an in utero stimulation or some sort of placental leak. Um, sources of that could be maternal if the mom has um, undiagnosed syphilis or if there was a torch syndrome. TORCH is a unique, it's an acronym actually, um, but it stands for, the T is for toxoplasmosis, um, the TO is actually for toxoplasmosis, the R stands for rubella, the C stands for CMV, and the H stands for type 2 herpes. So sometimes if babies have elevated IgM antibodies, then they can order a torch panel. They can take that off of uh, cord blood if, they, if it's available, or they can draw blood from the baby. It's a little bit better if you take it from cord blood. And sometimes um, they can check and see if the baby has been exposed to any of those um, diseases in utero. All right, so we've talked about IgG and IgM antibodies. Now we'll talk about some more. IgA antibodies do not cross the placenta. IgA protects uh, the secreting surfaces of the respiratory tract, the GI tract, and the eyes. However, Mother Nature is brilliant and she has a plan. If babies breastfeed, they will get colostrum, and colostrum is very high in IgA. So this is great, um, very good news. Newborns make their own IgA in their own intestinal mucosa about four weeks after birth. So that's why it's even if moms say, I do not want to breastfeed, are you willing to breastfeed for at least a few days so that your baby can get some of this colostrum and get some of these rich antibodies, which will help coat and protect that GI tract. It will help uh, protect the respiratory tract. Um, and then it's protective for the eyes as well. And 
And this concludes part two of the newborn adaptations to life. Stay tuned for part three. It's going to be super exciting.